Oh, well, good evening and welcome everybody to our evening service. It is so good to see every single one of you. Um, please let me just read this verse to start our hearts from the Bible. Psalm 119 verse 72. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. First of all, it's that the word of God from the Lord himself, from Jesus himself, is so precious to each one of us. And I don't know how busy your day is or how busy your day is going to be or has been. Or even right now, you may be sitting thinking, I've got so much things to do. My prayer is that you, God's word would be so precious to you. And it's so precious because it is precious. Jesus Christ always gives more than what this world can offer. What does it matter if a man gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? But when we come to Jesus, he comes with life and hope and peace and joy. So tonight I pray that you hear the word of the Lord and that you can say, like this, this psalmist here who says, do you know what, it, it's more precious than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. I could have all that in my bank, but if, my, if I'm not saved, if my life is not changed, if I don't know Jesus, it means nothing. So God bless you. And we're going to listen to our first song called The Lion of Judah. God bless.
Well, again, welcome every single person. And it's amazing, isn't it? He's the Lion of Judah, the Lamb who was slain. But he reigns victorious. He is our triumphant Lord. Um, Anne is going to do a reading just now. One of our members is going to be from the book of Revelations. We're going through that as an RBT book, which means reading the Bible together. And she's starting at verses 1. And she's going to read right the way through to verse 7. So I pray that you listen to it as it's read and that you hear God's word being read together. God bless you. Good evening. The reading is taken from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, to the church in Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love, Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favour. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Well, I pray that even as that the word of God was read to you there, that God, the Lord is beginning to speak to you. And I'm just going to pray now before I bring this word to you from Revelations and just really praying that God speaks to every single one of us, that we hear his voice tonight. And he helps us and gives us the strength that we need. Father God, please be with us. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for this great hope that we have. Thank you, Lord, that you fill our hearts with joy, with peace and hope. Lord, and even in suffering, Lord God, your Holy Spirit has poured your your love into our hearts, Lord God, so that even when we suffer, Lord, we suffer as loved people, Lord, people that are knowing your comfort, Lord God. So please, tonight, whoever this word finds the people, Lord God, I pray that you would speak. Lord, that is what we ask, Lord God. Let it not just be a person speaking to him. People are tired of people just speaking to them, giving them the wrong advice or the wrong way, Lord God. But Lord, we thank you that you speak truth, Lord. And I pray tonight by your power, Lord God, that you'd speak to each person. Lord, help me to just humble myself before you, Lord God, and allow your word to be uh, presented tonight, Lord God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So if you've ever read Revelations, you'll see that Jesus begins to speak to all the churches. And one of the first churches he speaks to here is Ephesus. And it's actually one of the churches that was planted after Jesus had risen from the grave. And the letters that are a mixture, that are a mixed bag of things. First of all, there's an encouragement that Jesus is speaking to you. And there's something good that he says. And then as you read the letters, there'll be some bits where it's hard. He's rebuking, but then he shows an answer. So each of the letters, you'll see that Jesus will speak something of himself, showing his character. And in this one, he says to the church, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, right. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hands and walks among the seven golden lampstands. So something that Jesus speaks about himself is, he says to them, I hold the seven stars in my right hand. First of all, he says to the angel, remember if you want to say, well, who's the angel? Some people will say these are the ministers of the church. Others will say these are the angels who pass on the message. Either way, Jesus is saying, I am getting my message across you. I'm communicating to the church. This is what I want you to write. I'm speaking to you, he's saying, I hold, this is the words of him who holds the seven stars 
and his right hand. Jesus is saying, first of all, he's saying, I, I walk among you. I walk among the churches. Remember, he's not saying I visit the church. He, he's saying, I'm at home in church. This is my home. I have saved you. I, I rescued you. And he's saying, you're in my, you're in my hand. Remember the stars were made on the fourth day of creation and they were put there to govern the day and the night and to give light on the earth. And that is a picture of the church. He, he said, I hold the church in my hand. Remember on the third day of creation is picturing Jesus Christ's resurrection and then it's fitting on the fourth day. Now his church has been um, made alive as it were and they're there to govern. And he's saying, in my right hand, in my victorious right hand, my right hand of strength, Jesus saying, I'm holding you. So he's speaking to you. First of all, he's saying to you, I'm at home with you. I'm with you. And I've got you in my hand. There was a man in Psalm 73 who was a church member who was falling away. He was struggling. He began to envy the wicked. He couldn't really tell people about it, but he told the Lord about it. And it wasn't until he actually came back to church he realized, oh, it's good for me to be near God again. And he says in that Psalms that the Lord holds me by the right hand. He holds me. And that's what Jesus is really saying to each one of us. He's saying, before I speak to you, I want you to know that I hold you. And I hold you with strength. And I hold you for a purpose because you're, you're, you're called to shine for me. You're called to be my ambassadors. You're called to be my witnesses. And I've got you close. And he's saying, you're near me. And also he said, I walk among the seven golden lampstands, picturing the church saying, I've given you my spirit. The golden lampstands were seen in the tabernacle of God and they were there to shine light. And the, on those lampstands, they would have branches with buds and blossoms. It was almond blossoms. And really Jesus is saying, when I've got you in my hands, my spirit is going to give you life. You think, where is the life going to come from as a Christian? We come dead, don't we? But the Bible says that you're made alive in God. And Jesus is saying to you, before I speak to you, as I speak to you, I want you to know I'm, I've got you in my hand. I'm at home with you and I'm giving you life. So he's reassuring us by truth. He's reassuring us just by turning up and being who he is and showing us this. And he very much speaks to this church. He says to them, I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them to be false. Jesus wants to know, let you know, he says, I know it's hard for you. It's hard for you because you want the real deal. You don't want anything false. You really want everything that Jesus Christ has said he is. You don't want a false freedom. You don't want a false way. You're willing to test things that are put before you. They were willing to, the, the, this church, Ephesus, they couldn't tolerate wicked people. They couldn't tolerate people who said they were apostles. False teachers coming and saying, we know the way. They test it and say, no, we don't want that. I want the real Jesus and I want the real church and if you read Ephesus in the book of Acts chapter 18 and 19 you see that they weren't a church like that they were a church that they were taught accurately by Paul and Apollos that Paul went there and preached for three months boldly to them so these were a church that, that, that got off to a good start. And that's what Jesus is saying. You, you, you got off to a good start. You, you were taught about the gospel. You were taught about Christ. And once you've been taught about that, you don't want anything. You don't want any rubbish other than that. And this church, Ephesus as well, they were known for not tolerating wicked people. Or they were, in one way, they were known for not tolerating false Christianity. There was a situation that happened there in the book of Acts that... There were these seven men called the seven sons of Sceva. And they had seen Paul casting out demons. And they went to go and try and cast out demons. And it's, the demons said to these seven sons of Sceva, they said, Paul we know, Jesus we know, but who are you? And they jumped on these seven sons of Sceva and beat them up so badly. And it was the church at Ephesus that had watched that situation and realized, do you know what? There can be false Christianity. There can be a false way. And they were so torn up by that, 
that they actually feared God from that situation and they repented. They're the ones, if you read about Ephesus, they were the ones that had that big bonfire of all their sorcery books and they repented by Basically, they went into their libraries and took millions of pounds worth of books and burnt them. And it was after that situation where they saw these seven false Christians trying to cast out a demon who got beaten up um, because they weren't really following Jesus. And really, I think that was the picture. They saw these people that weren't really following Jesus. And they said, do you know what? If you're not really following Jesus, you can't expect the work of the devil to be destroyed in your life. And so there was, a, there was an urgency in the heart to say, I don't want to be taught wrong. Because if I'm taught wrong, it's dangerous for me. It's dangerous for my family. It's dangerous. And so there was a, a willingness that says, you have not tolerated wicked people, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them to be false. You're... If, if I'm speaking to you tonight, you're basically, the Lord is saying to you, you're, you're going to test what has been put before you. You're not just going to accept. You're saying, I'm going to test this. Is this the real deal or is this false? Because you're basically saying, I, I won't be fooled. I'm, and, I'm not, and Jesus is saying, I know that about you. I know that you don't want to be fooled. And, and then th that way, it's a good thing. He's saying, I know it's hard for you. I know your deeds, I know your perseverance is that you've gone through struggles, you've gone through different things. And Jesus is saying, I know that about you. And I know that you're willing to suffer for Jesus. It says, you have persevered and endured hardships for my name and you have not grown weary. And it's like the whole picture of this Christian is that God's the same you, you're characterized by this ab ability to say, I'm not going to give up. I I'm willing to suffer for Jesus. And the church at Ephesus was like that. They were the church that had that riot. There was a Christian riot. Basically, lots of people were getting saved. They used to make idols in that city. But the, I the I people that were selling these idols made of silver could no longer sell those idols anymore because people were getting saved. They don't want to buy these idols. They were chucking away their idols. But that means that the businessmen who were making money off these idols were losing money. And so they kicked up a big riot, took on some Christians. I think a couple of people got beaten. But that church survived that situation. Could you imagine a Christian riot in town of Bari where people were kicking off and saying, these Christians are stopping our businesses. And you getting dragged up to the town square and people threatening you, saying, how dare you follow Jesus? How dare you wreck our livelihoods? And our families, and they were shouting, this is the great um, city of Armaeus, the god of Armaeus. And the, but basically they were saying, look, it, it's our way or the highway. But the church at Ephesus endured that and said, no, it's, it's Jesus' way. And I'm going to follow that name. And Jesus is saying that to you tonight. He says, I know that you've been through situations in your life that could have toppled you. They were potential shipwreckers of your faith. You, you've gone through things. Jesus said, I hold you in my hands. I hope, and I walk among you and I've given you life by my spirit. And you've gone through a situation that that could have been the end for you. But you've said, I've not grown weary. You endured it and you went past through it. And you think to yourself that this type of Christian would be the ideal Christian. They persevere, they endure, they're, they're willing to pay the cost. But Jesus says, but there's a problem. You're, you're characterized, if I can put it simply like this, you're characterized by hard work. That's what marks you out as a Christian. And your hard work is directly related to the fact that you follow Jesus Christ. And you're willing, and you don't want to be fooled, you want the real deal and you've gone through difficulties in the past, and guess what, you're not giving up. And you would think that's an amazing Christian, isn't it? They've gone through a difficult situation, they've been tested themselves in that sense to whether they're gonna follow Christ, and they're saying, no, I'm not gonna give up. Ideal Christian, amazing, but Jesus says, I have this against you. He says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you have at first. If you've ever seen this passage being preached, it's been preached so many times, isn't it? In so many different ways. But let me just 
consider from an, a different angle of this tonight. What does it mean, rejected your first love? First of all, it's saying you've rejected it. In other words, you've pushed it away. You, you, forsaken something means you, you've almost seen it as no value anymore. But what is it that is your first love? See, some Christians would see this is me about me loving other people. This is about me used to being a loving person and now I'm not loving anymore. Whereas actually the Bible tells us that we love because he first loved us. Our first love is the fact that he gave us love first of all. We love from a place of being loved. And Ephesians If you read the book of Ephesians, this church knew that. This church in Ephesians, who was known for their hard work, knew that. that It says they were adopted by love. That that was the motivation of God to save them. And it's the motivation of God to save every single person. He's not just doing a legal obligation. It'd be so cold-hearted that God said, it's just a legal obligation. No, there was a motivation behind this act of love it was love itself God said I've sent Jesus my son Jesus went to the cross because of love he said I've adopted you into my my family you're a child of God and it's so overwhelming if you read Ephesians this love is so overwhelming that God said I need you I need to give you power to be able to grasp how wide and long and deep It's so vast, this love that surpasses knowledge. It's so big, but God said, I'll give you power to grasp it. And that's what you were called to do. And if you see that in Ephesians, that Paul prays, I pray that they will have the power to grasp how wide and long and deep this love is. And God's saying, before you go forward, grasp this love. In fact, going forward is grasping this love. And now he's saying to the church, you've left that love. You're leaving the... The, the thing that will make you grow. There's, what else is there for you? You see, what we have to realize as a Christian, and we can all trip up with this, is hard work does not equal love. Many times we think that, isn't it? I think I'll, I'll work hard. I'm, I'm determined. We say it in our married men say this. I'm really determined to love my wife. I'm going to work really hard. And that shows, and then the moment your love is... Um, not seen for what it is, but you feel bad, don't you? But hard work doesn't equal love. And look at what it says here in Corinthians. If I give all I possess to the poor and have not love, I gain nothing. Most people will know that. But there's a bit after that. It says, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardships, I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Here it's saying, if I was to say, right, I am going to give my body over to Christ, and and I'm going to say that I'm not going to give up, even if I go through a difficult situation, I'm I'm a, I'm not going to quit. I'm I'm not going to give up following Jesus. But the Bible says, if you do that without love. You can boast about it. You can say, well, look at me. I, I don't give up. I keep coming. I keep serving. But the Bible says if you don't do it with love, if there's no love in your heart, then it's nothing. And that's why Jesus says, I want you to consider how far you have fallen and repent and do the things you did at first. So first of all, he says, I want you to think how far you've fallen away from this love. This first love. You see, remember, it's his love for you. It's not so much your your love is going to be a, a, a natural reaction to his love for you. You're going to love because you've been loved. So actually, when God says to you, repent and do the things at first, what he's saying is don't remember what your love was like. Remember his love. Remember Jesus' love to you. That even though you were a sinner, that he give you the ability to, as it says in Deuteronomy, to ride on the heights of the land and be nourished by the ground. Remember that, Jesus, and remember the height you've been fallen. Remember he's lifted you up, adopted in love and seated you in the heavenly places. That he's given you every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. He's, the Bible says that he's lavished this love upon you. And yes, you were so undeserving. Yes, you were a sinner. Yes, you were in darkness. Yes, you were 
on your way, holding by your fingernails on the way to hell, but he came and he loved you and cared for you. Remember in Ezekiel where it says, I, I found you kicking and screaming in your own blood, but I come and I loved you and I covered over your nakedness and I adorned you with beautiful jewelry as it were and clothed you. So when it's saying um, re repent and do the things at first, it's saying come back to his love. And if, yes, then it makes you have love for other Christians. And that's what Ephesians has. They had love for all the saints. But there's a problem, isn't it? When we grow fat, the Bible says, we begin to kick against that love. And the Bible clearly warns us that not to be separate. Don't go now live like a Gentile. Don't become darkened in your understanding. Once your understanding has been given this light and this love, and it's been, you've been given power to grasp your, this love, why now go and think like a, a non-believer? Why now go and think like a Gentile? Because what will happen is you begin to live separated from the life of God. But Jesus says, I want you to repent. Really, he's saying, I, I want you to turn back to my love. But he says here, if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove the lampstand from its place. What does that mean? Many Christians try to figure out what this means, but look at it like this. That lampstand that God has given us as a church is to, it was, the light was there just to light what was in front of it. In the tabernacle, you'll remember you have the, the bread, the presence, the altar, the throne of God. You would be able to see the sacrifice. And what it's saying here is that light, your light helps other people see where the bread is. It helps them see Jesus's, and it helps them see Jesus' sacrifice. It helps them to see where prayer is. It helps them to see how all these things fit together. Remember, we are the manifold wisdom of God shown off to the rulers. And, and um, that light was to always be kept burning. You see, the light truly is His light being given to us. We're only shining the light that has already been given to us by the Spirit, by the oil of God, if I could put it like that. And we're caused to be a light. But the Bible says no one lights a lamp and hides it. You see, the, this church, they had left, left their first love. They, they were known for hard work, but they left this place of knowing that they're loved. And therefore, they weren't shining any light. They weren't able to give any love because they weren't receiving that love for themselves. And when God says, if, you, if you're not going to turn away from that, you, he's basically saying, if you won't shine, you can't shine. He's like saying, I, I've got to remove this lampstand because you've, you've hidden it anyway. You're not allowing it to, to, to shine the way it should shine. You've forsaken your first love. You've moved maybe into just hard work and you, you maybe think your hard work is love, but God's saying it's not. And that can be hard for us to hear. But God says, you have something in your favour. He says, but you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nickelodeon, Nickel, Nickelodeons, which I also hate. God says there's something that's going to help you get out of this. And what is going to help you is what you hate. You see, many of us don't want to become what we hate, don't we? And Ephesians, they, they did not want to become false Christians. They did not want, they couldn't tolerate wicked people. They couldn't tolerate this false Christianity that doesn't destroy the works of the devil. And that's who these Nicolaians is. These ones who practice basically the devil's work. And Jesus said, you hate it and I hate it. And what he's saying is, don't now you become what you hate. People say that about their, especially if they've had a horrible parent. Um, who was who's genuinely horrible, not these false, horrible parents, but genuinely horrible. And they say, I, I don't want to become them. And they fear that. Or they see this other person and they say, I don't want to become that. And God's saying, that is in your favour. And I think he, he's saying it because you're in danger of becoming that. You be, People say it about Christians, isn't it? Unfortunately, it happens, isn't it? When some Christians get older, they can get really grumpy and, and nasty. 
and they've left their first love, they've left the, the love that they had. And some people say, I don't want to become that. I don't want to turn out like that. And Jesus says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. See, Jesus really wants your Christian life to be paradise. And it starts off, he says, if you've got an ear to hear. You see, first step of repentance is having ears that are willing to repent. And he's saying, do the things that you did at first. And let me just see it like this. Think about the thief on the cross. What did he do at first? Remember it says there, so that you've got the thief dying next to Jesus. And he, Jesus, he says to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. So remember, Jesus is on the cross. He's got two criminals at either side of them. Two thieves. Who are genuinely dying for their sins. Jesus is in the middle, the spotless Lamb of God, who has done no wrong. And the two on the either side have done wrong. They're both mocking Jesus at first, and the other one begins to see this is the Christ, this is Jesus, this is the Saviour, and he needs to repent. Just like this church needs to repent. It says, consider how far you have fallen, repent and do the things at first. So this man, the thief on the cross, He's considering one way how far he has fallen. He's fallen from, if I could put it this way, he's fallen away from Jesus' love. You've got Jesus, isn't it? Think about that. He's dying between two people, two thieves, and he, and he loves both these thieves. That's what stirs my heart so much. It's this truth that Jesus Christ comes filled with grace and help and love. And ultimately, they're, he, they're both falling away from that love. But one of the thieves begins to realize, he begins to repent and he says this, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You see, they're dying and Jesus is dying, but Jesus is going to be raised from the, the, the dead, victorious, paying for their sins by his blood, going up to his kingdom. Whereas if these two reject him, they would be going down into hell, down into Hades. But this man says, remember me. How can this, what is it about this man who shows us do the things you did at first? Jesus says to the man, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. It says here again in Revelations, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Je Jesus is that tree of life that he, he wants you to eat from. So when God says to you, repent and do the things at first, what is it the, cro the, the man, the thief on the cross is doing at first? He just says this, Jesus, remember me. And what does Jesus say? Jesus answered, truly I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. What is it? How do you get back your first love? Well, it's going to be remembering that you're loved. And what you need to do is just say, Jesus, remember me. Remember me. You see, we're all like that dying thief on the cross. We're all bankrupt, all vacant, as it were, of any life. We're sinners, lost. And part of you coming to your first love is realizing how much Jesus Christ loves you. Just like the Ephesians, he gives you power to grasp how wide is this love? How long is this love? How deep is this love? Jesus, I'm dying on the, on the cross next to you. I'm a thief. I, I've, I've sinned. Think about that. Picture that dying man right now. Picture him next to Jesus. He's saying, I've sinned. I'm lost. I'm doomed. I'm darkness. Even when I'm dying, I'm still mocking God. Even when I'm dying, I've still got a bad, a, a, the wrong attitude. But right next to me, I see great love being demonstrated. I see Jesus dying on the cross. You know, it's, it, you've got this amazing demonstration of love of Jesus dying on the cross there. And right next to you, you've got everything that we are. Sin and um, guilty and shame and nakedness and taking punishment right there. 
But in that moment, we can say, Jesus, remember me. Does your love reach me? Does your love help me? Does your love get to me? And Jesus is saying, yes, it does. Can you grasp my love? Can you grasp it? Can you grasp how much I care for you? Do you grasp how much this love, can you grasp how wide it is that even though you're on a cross, you're on the cross right next to me, even though you're near death, even though you have sinned, even though you're guilty, even though you're seconds away from dying, my love can reach you and not only can it reach you, it bring you to paradise. And what we have to go through as we go through our struggles and our difficulties that the Lord loves you. Remember His love. Remember what kind of a love it is. It's for a sinner who's dying on the cross next to Him. It's you are that dying thief on the cross. And that is the first love. That is the first love that you experienced. And Jesus is saying, if you're victorious, if you can hear that, I'll give you the right to eat from the tree of life. He's saying, you can, you can just eat of that love. You can eat of that tree. And you can be in paradise. You see, we love because he first loved us. And what I believe the Lord is saying to this church here is, you're working hard. You're working really hard. And you're not going to give up. And you want the real deal. And Jesus said, my love is the real deal. You're going to need power to grasp how wide it is, how deep it is, how long it is. You're going to have to repent. Consider how far you've fallen and repent and do the things at first. All you did at first was say, Jesus, help me. Jesus, remember me. And Jesus saying, when you're going through your difficulties and struggles, don't you think I love you enough to help you? Don't, don't you think, you maybe think, it's, I've got to prove myself, I've got to work hard, I've got to do this. And you do need to work hard in life, you do need to serve and do well. But you've got to remember His love is there, reaching out to you, sustaining you and giving you life. And we need power to grasp it because we feel so unworthy for that love. But Jesus says, do the things that you did at first. Like the dying thief, come back to that love of Jesus. He loves you so much. He cares for you so much. And be filled with that love. Jesus says, yeah, I hold this against you. You've forsaken the love that you had at first. You were given love. You were shown love. You were shown this incredible, I'm not talking about the world's love, I'm talking about God's love. You were shown this love. You were shown compassion and you're still shown it now. Don't move away from that. Don't move away from that place of saying, do you know what, I can't fix myself. I can't change myself. I want to do good in life. I do want to work hard, but that's not going to be the merit of this relationship of God, the merit is that He loves you. He's adopted you as His child. His hand is upon you. It's overwhelming. Yes, it's it's like I don't deserve it, God. Oh, this is so much love. This is so much kindness. This is so much care. But the Lord is saying, "That is who I am." He loves you, and it's an overwhelming and amazing love. And from that place of being blown over by His love. The Lord said, then you'll be able to love with this type of love. So this evening, the Lord is saying, I know you work hard. I know it's a struggle and I know that you don't want to give up. But you've forgotten what my love is like. And he's saying, you need to come back to that. You need to turn back to that. Because he's saying to us, if you don't turn, to back, turn back to that, you're not going to shine. You're not going to be able to show people my sacrifice the way that I want you to show it. But the Lord is saying, but if you have an ear to turn back to that love that you had at first, God is saying, you're going to eat from the tree of life. You're going to know paradise again. So Jesus is really saying, repent and turn back to paradise tonight. You maybe don't feel you deserve it. You maybe feel like I'm too great of a sinner. The Lord is saying, his arms are open towards you. Come back and know my love, he's saying. Know this love of God. How wide, how long, how deep is the love of God that is in Christ Jesus.
It's a love, the Bible says, that surpasses knowledge. So I pray tonight, let's pray together. Father God, help us, Lord, to know your love. Help us to experience it again, just like the first time. Oh God, please speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our first song called, Here is love vast as an ocean, love and kindness as a flood. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Fiction. 